Hello again, friends. And you are our friends, and it's going to be one of those shows today. Welcome <laughs> back to another edition of Jim Cornette's drive Through, the final chance you have to pull up to the drive Through in 2019. I'm the great Brian Last. I'm reading your questions. They're sent on Twitter using the hashtag Corny drive Through via email to CornyDriveThru at gmail.com. And the man answering them, the leader of the cult of Cornette, Mr. Jim Cornette. <laughs> Hello again, friends, and fuck all of you is what you wanted to say. You know that's what you wanted to say, Brian Last, because you are, for once, for once, I am not the grumpy one. For once, I am not the the cranky, cantankerous old malcontent that you're trying to somehow drag an entertaining show out of. In this case, the, the worm has turned. Reversal. And Brian Last, you are as miserable this morning. You are as pissed off as I've ever heard you. You have all kinds of of audio issues over there. You were about to throw your headset, your headphones out the window. You can't hear in one ear. And then and then you your your replacement head just was not up to snuff and you cursed it and used these the foulest language I've ever heard you use, all all these epithets. Somebody said to me on Twitter, said, well, you you constantly use all those horrible epitaphs. I've never once done a horrible epitaph, but I have uttered terrible epithets. And and that's what you were doing. And 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 just foul language and curse. We will not tolerate that kind of fucking language around here. And I wish that for the, we ought to do a Christmas episode of you just lose. It was your Casey Kasem dead dog dedication moment, but we didn't get it on tape. I wasn't going to stop you until you said something that wasn't true. You've said nothing but the truth so far. <laughs> I was waiting for you to say something. I go, wait, that's not true. But everything you just said is true. I'm in a pissy mood. My headphones are pissing me off. And we it's got the listeners questions. Very slipshod start to a, a fine program that set all these attendance records and all these ratings records and downloads records and <laughs> records for controversies over the last year. A very slipshod way to end this. You can only hear out of one ear and, and, and just in a sour mood. I could tell it. I could tell the insincerity. The insincerity in your voice, Brian Last. I could tell it. The insincerity. You are phony. As a get well card from an undertaker when you said hello, friends. This is no way to begin Hanukkah. I'll tell you that. <laughs> All right. <sighs> anyway, since this is a new program, and this is actually technically the last new program of 2019 for us, because the last new experience aired just a few days ago, but this that we've beaten it, and I'm officially about to go on my hermitage, my sabbatical, my mental health rehabilitation uh christmas break um uh, so but so we got to address some of the things in the news uh, on the program before we get to the questions because this is the last chance we got we have fine programming by the way coming up uh for the next what uh, 12 days or so on the experience and the drive through we got all kinds of of uh, bus rides for the fans for the cult members of uh, of uh, lined up with who is it now again? I've... <laughs> Dave Meltzer, great. followed by oh, Jim yeah. Ross, followed by the Charlotte Fan Fest. There you go. Uh, all kinds of omnibuses over the next 12 days or so, and then we'll be back in, in next year. We'll be back in a year with new programming. And the Cornets Collectibles update, real briefly, before we get into the controversies, is everything that was purchased from jimcornette.com by Friday evening December, what the fuck was it, 20th at 7.45 when the last one came in um, has been uh, has been filled, has been put in the mail. I stayed up all night, Friday night. And uh, as we promised, there is a notice on the website and also a few people have still purchased things and that's fine. They're getting uh, hopefully a, a nice auto reply email and we've got the notice on the website that we'll begin filling things again uh, uh, starting January 3rd, but everything, if you bought something, it's in the hands of the postal service now. And I'm still going to be, if you are listening, there's like six, seven, eight people out of the fucking 
what was it? it like literally between 17 and 1900 packages that I've mailed out over the last five weeks. I think I'm st- six or seven or eight people have emailed, where's my shit. And I, that's on the postal service. I'm still going to be getting with them to either offer to send out a replacement package or a refund or whatever. But otherwise everything's in a mail if you bought something. So it's out of my hand. My hands are clean. And uh, we're waiting now for the Postal Service to work their magic. I'll tell you one thing. If Bree and Stephen and Lib and John the Hunchback and the whole crew here at my branch were in charge of the, the entire Postal Service, things would get done a lot, a lot better and a lot faster because they're a fine, fine crack staff. Do you think that's what the other customers at your location say, or do they go, why are these people always so busy with that man holding the tennis racket? <laughs> no, actually... They 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 actually say why are they they so busy with that man with the dolly because pretty much every time I walk in a door I've got one of those stand up dollies that holds the three giant you you know I've got the OCD right so after I pack the packages and the boxes and the orders and everything I have these three giant cardboard boxes that fit perfectly stacked one on top of another it ends up about six feet tall about my height. And it goes right on my stand-up dolly, and I can lean it back and then put, and I can go right in the door, boom, 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 and carry like 120 to 150 different packages and boxes and envelopes and things of that nature around easily. So I'm standing there with a fucking giant dolly and these giant boxes of shit handing it over the counter. They know I'm going to be there a while. Does anyone ever say hello, dolly, when you walk in? I think you need to go back and polish that one. Brian, you're not having the best morning on I'm all not. levels here, I'm are not. you? You really you ought to go back to bed. Perhaps goodbye, Dolly. Um, but again, <laughs> anyway, let's bring up the, the biggest controversy because we talked about it on the experience Friday, but we didn't give it the attention it deserved because it started getting attention when it be, when it became a, a, a me, a Mimi, a Mimi on the internet. One of those Mimi's. When we reviewed the uh, All Elite Wrestling show from last Wednesday night and that fucking putrid four-finger stinker of an abortion of an angle at the end of the show with the dork order and the creepers and the and the crappers. It's now going to be, instead of the dark order and the creepers, it's going to be the dork order and the crappers because they took a giant crap in the ring. And I mentioned, because the whole thing fell flat and they beat up all the people that are purported to be and alleged to be their top baby faces and the greatest wrestlers and tag teams in the world and et cetera, with the, the fat guy in a mask and a fucking, you know, a bunch of clown show fucking goofs running around. And I mentioned in passing, I said, there was one guy who was on top of one of the baby faces. Turned out it was Dustin Rhodes. It was fucking, he was punching him and he wasn't even fucking hitting him. But I didn't give it the attention it deserved because I had seen that live and it caught my eye for a second. But as everybody now has gone back and more people have analyzed this part of uh, all elite wrestling television than the Zapruder film, I think, at this point. And we don't even know yet who's on the grassy knoll. People are taking credit for it. More on that in a minute. But they had a when it played live at least as i as i saw it i was writing and making notes right so i was glancing up but i saw the wide shot where there's all these goofs in the ring and they're all dressed the same kind of shit but they're beating up the baby faces and i saw the one guy down in the in and just for a second i said well he's not even hitting him but i didn't think that much of it because there's so much other shit going on but apparently they also got a floor camera shot when it went back and looked at it. And then also one guy made a, a close up shot of, of it, you know, kind of zoomed in so that you could actually see. And the guy was punching straight past Dustin straight past like six inches or a foot past him down to the mat. And, and Dustin, <clears throat> Some people were saying, "Well, why was Dustin selling it when you're when you're in a fight, a, 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 when you're in a worked fight like that, and you go down and you're on the bottom, you do legitimately cover up and try to duck your head because you trust that the guy above you is going to be doing something that looks halfway legitimate. And when you feel motion and everything, you're trying to go with it and sell it. So it's I've been in that position. Everybody else has in, that's been in the ring." In something like that, it's not Dustin's fault for selling what he thought somebody was doing. 
right? But this fucking guy wasn't even trying. Either that or this was... It, is it possible that they just let a bunch of, instead of putting, you know, local guys who were trained or, you know, independent wrestlers or, you know, extras that they brought in, is it possible they just found some fucking merchandise help and some people like that and say, here, put this outfit on? I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know what the, the I mean, even stars from around the world of wrestling even the blue meanie was like fuck you guys right they were tweeting this guy needs to be fucking fired fire this fucking guy now i don't think he works there everyone uh, you know everyone on twitter i mean i saw trish stratus mark henry we got a question here about randy orton who just went off on it but everyone in wrestling even dustin i think i saw tweet about it i mean just yeah well because this is the most unprofessional thing i've ever seen whoever this guy was either they let somebody in the ring on national television to do physical shit that had never done physical shit before, or this guy was ass and off going into business for himself, being a fucking clown because nobody would have told him to do that. And nobody who could do any better would do that on purpose. Even unless they were doing it on purpose. Yeah. It, anyway. So this whole thing fucking blew up and became, and, and there, even there, there was some, a Danny Cage of the Monster Factory. He's a good friend of Rip Rogers's. Uh, but he had tw has shot down some outlaw guy somewhere. Actually got on Twitter and claimed that. Well, it was me. It was me and I was just trying to fucking take care of Dustin because I thought he might be hurt or something like that. Trying to get attention on himself. And I can't remember what the fucking guy's name was now. I, I, I want to say uh, Cannon, Freddie Boom Boom Cannon. That was a, the, we had the hit in 1962 with Palisades Park. But somebody named Cannon, right? And Danny Cage comes out on Twitter and says, no, I checked. You weren't even there, motherfucker. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> you know, yeah. He wasn't even in the fucking town, right? So people are now taking um, credit for this. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's like, you got, yes. It's because they think, well, I'll be the biggest star in wrestling. All of a sudden, nobody's heard of me before or whatever the fuck. I don't know. But yeah. And, but the, the, the fallout also has been that the young bucks have quit Twitter because, because apparently, I don't know who could have been prescient enough who could have been intelligent enough and 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 forethinking enough to to prognosticate that these two clowns couldn't fucking handle the big time uh but uh, basically because apparently since they take credit for the tag team division right and oh boy the S super smash brothers we just need to get them a good gimmick <laughs> and, or whatever the fuck and, and now and this angle they got such fucking heat on Twitter that they uh, they took their fucking Twitter accounts down. And, but but now Papa Buck, their father, did did reveal in a statement on his Twitter that his sons. I, this is a quote: "Are okay." Unquote. <laughs> like like they've been a goddamn plane crash in the Guatemalan jungle, and they've just fished them out of the fucking Congo river at the fucking foot of the thing in some crocodile's fucking jaw. Right. And oh, they're okay. They're okay. They just needed a break from the toxicity. And uh, cause uh, wait, I wish I knew what it was like. People have to say horrible things about me on Twitter. I don't know if I could handle it. Oh my God. Uh, but anyway, so we got the young bucks off of Twitter because fact, they were all there to take the love, right? But when the fucking people start jumping on them for shit that they did, or in my case, for many times for shit that I don't do, um, do we just say fuck you and, and block you or fuck you and don't block you so that I can continue to say fuck you? Or do they just take their ball and go home? Anyway, to quote the great president, Harry S. Truman, if you can't stand the heat, Get out of the kitchen. And in this case, they uh, they closed the kitchen down, apparently. Unless it's some well, kind of angle for their little internet show. I mean, you never really know. Well, how about this? This could be, a, to paraphrase, the great Harry S. Truman of Missouri. If you can't shoot anything other than blanks, don't call your show dynamite. Because these the punches, the, the meme of the punches of the still mysterious, and I mean, this guy's name, 
sooner or later, every great masked wrestler in the world gets found out. And we found out after a while that Mil Moskris was Aaron Rodriguez. And we found out after a while that the Destroyer was Dick Byer. We found out after a while that Mr. Wrestling 2 was Johnny Walker. But will anybody ever... Except the people, the the mud show fucks that want to make themselves as stars by trying to insinuate that they were this guy. Will we ever find out who this guy was? You know, I haven't watched their uh, We're the Elite or whatever the stupid internet show they have is. But I've always heard that they've taken pot shots at people. They've goofed on people. They've obviously goofed on the WWE. It is interesting that as soon as the tide turned a little bit, as soon as the AEW fans started complaining about this tag team division and this awful angle to end the last show they have of 2019 that these guys just tucked their tail between their legs and ran. Well, here's the whole thing. I, I take no pride in being right all the time. It's just something that keeps happening to me. But I knew, and as I said from the start, my first communication, and I found out who that this guy wanted to be in business with, and everything that they were saying from the start, the level of overconfidence was staggering. This cannot possibly go wrong or go bad or not succeed, because a lot of money and boy people fucking think we're great. And so we're just going to fucking beat a guy that's been in this business for fucking 50 years and and has billions of dollars and every major star in the world under contract. Um, that level of overconfidence is basically like you standing in front of somebody that you're having a fucking fight with with your legs spread, squared off so he can kick you right in the balls. And this, we're going to go change the world from these two middle school looking simpering fucks was staggering. And they're going to find out you don't change the world. You don't go to the moon until you know how to build a rocket. And the first rocket you ever build doesn't make it to the fucking moon, motherfucker. So these, the, the, the dork order and the crappers and the meme of the missing punches have become a metaphor for all elite wrestling's television program. They are missing the mark or in this case, missing the marks. They're missing half the marks they had watching the show at the start. And NXT is now beating them as we predicted, because they have access to every wrestler that fucking a mainstream star in the world and put on the more professional program. And the guys who tore down the houses in all these rec centers and VFW halls and in Japan where apparently they have strange fetishes of their own involving blow-up sex dolls, small school children, and things with tentacles. Doesn't mean you can do it on national TV in the United States of America especially when you tell everybody from the start that you're ass off to begin with and you're not serious about any of this. Whether it's jazz, handsy, finger-pointing, prissy-prancing, fancy-dancing, fucking running and simpering, or whether it's fucking super-kicking everything in sight, including the fucking backstage production assistants, or whether it's bench-pressing 16 pounds in a fucking promo or whether it's just ass and off in general or whether it's the fucking boss who's already opened himself up to enough criticism, whether they called for it or not giving someone a fucking stunner in front of people. (laughs) Did you see his tweet about that? Oh, well, I had no choice. I had no choice. (laughs) <laughs> and, and, you know, but at the same time he really had no choice because you know he they put him in a position on purpose to make him look bad to get over with him they oh we're going to give tony the chance to do a stunner because everybody can participate and we all want to live our dream and also he's the boss and he's paying us and then he takes the heat for it they buried him if he had not done it he would have been buried but they shouldn't have had him in a fuck in that position anyway they were feeding the fucking money mark his fucking dream and he had to take it and he got buried for it and it shouldn't have been done on that fucking show whether it was on television or off especially they don't understand and realize they are finally starting to realize by the feedback they're getting 
that most wrestling fans, much less most people in general that are watching a national television cable network, don't want to see this outlaw goofy shit in wrestling or anything else. And that's what I said was going to flop from the start, and that's what was going to doom them, and that's what's happening, because that's all that they're good at is this goofy outlaw shit. And that has a limited shelf life. I don't think Gigi Allen would have been hosting a goddamn network television special on NBC at Christmas time in the fucking late 90s or mid 90s or whatever it was right before he fucking died. It was a niche product. There have been a lot of indie bands that get a good following and then go to a major label and it doesn't work out well. I'm curious your thoughts on something, because, you know, the Bucks are booking the tag team division. Apparently, it's their decision to go all the way with the Dark Order, because they're friends, they're longtime friends, and obviously, from Brandon Cutler to Excalibur, if you're friends with the Bucks, you're hooked up. So, some people say, and I'd be one of them, that the Bucks don't know how to book a tag team division, they don't know what they're doing. And others will say, well, it's because they're so unselfish. (laughs) That it's not that they're not good at booking, it's just that they're point of view right now is they're so unselfish because they're trying to use themselves to get everyone else over which i would say falls under my category of they're not good at this but what are your thoughts on the fact that some people are saying that the bucks it's not that they don't don't know what they're doing running their tag team division it's just that they're so unselfish that they're trying (sighs) to help everyone else we examined this when they had the match with private party and they put them over one, two, three and did it in such a way that we said, was it either accidental? Cause they're just that stupid and they don't know what they're doing. Or did they bury these guys like a Hulk Hogan put over job because the way that they structured the finish private party gave one of the bucks that outstanding finish the fucking hurricane run into the RKO in the middle of the ring. Boom. But then that wasn't the legal guy. So that buck rolled out on the floor. And then they did their fucking 360, or not 360, but the goddamn big flip, whatever the fuck it is that Queen does, Quinn does off the top rope. The big splash. And boom, on the other buck, and one and got a two count. And then both those bucks, after those two moves were strong enough to where the one buck reversed one of Quinn's fucking moves and had him up for the tombstone. And the other buck was going to give him their fucking Meltzer driver finish when just a pull of the leg from the, the other uh, Kennedy and a roll up boom, one, two, three and private party wins on a fluke out of nowhere. Either one of those previous finishes would have got private party over convincingly in front of that crowd and you could tell by the goddamn reaction uh to the false finishes but they had to go one step further and make sure it was a fluke and that they were okay after their big moves so i questioned whether it was either they're just that stupid they didn't realize that or they were hulk hogan like in that they knew exactly what they were doing and we got people weighing in on both sides but it's either it's not that they're being unselfish it, it, it's it's either that they just don't know what they're doing or as we posited the theory this past week on the experience that they just think that they're they are both them and omega are so delusional that they think they are such big stars to the mainstream audience instead of their niche following that they feel like if they fucking do a job for any of these people well, it'll suddenly just make them stars. So in, in that case, maybe they're being unselfish because they're such huge stars that they can just anoint these people by putting them over. But if that's the case, then they're being unselfish at the same time as they're being completely fucking stupid and delusional about their standing in the community. And they ain't that fucking over to where they can go on national TV to, uh, and, and we mentioned also, they're down to the audience now that knows who the fuck they are. The the half of the 50% of the audience that they've lost since the debut were the people who didn't know who the fuck they were, but was going to watch this new wrestling program. Um, and now they're they're probably down to the people that know who the fuck they are. But if they want to get any new people, new people to join the party... 
then they have to be a fucking star to someone more than who they are right now, and they're not. And this is not the way to get over as stars. So this whole thing is a conundrum wrapped in an enigma surrounded by a uh, Gordian knot of puzzlement. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll see if we find out who that masked man was. Thank you, masked man, as Lenny Bruce may have said. (laughs) The the most sought after identity. People are going to have private detectives on the trail of this guy. Um, I wonder if he just rolled out of the fucking ring and just ran out the back door without changing that night. Could they have ended 2019, their last show? Because, again, they have no show this week because of Christmas. Could they have ended with a worse show to go on a two-week break? Well, no, and I don't I don't know, once again, why the last why wasn't the last thing you saw Jericho and Jungle Boy if they wanted to make a star? Why in the world was that not the television main event? Instead, I know they wanted to go to kick ass top of the nine o'clock Eastern hour and go through that. But it t- <laughs> the whole gimmick of the dork order is insane to begin with, to think that you would put this much time and effort into it, because if people were doing it right, it would still look stupid. The fat guy would still be fucking fat and horrible to look at offensive to the eyes the fucking creepers would still be acting stupid and and look appalling to most normal viewers uh, th- uh, nothing about this if if people if they were doing it right they would still be the shits right but they they did it wrong and they really and it sucked really badly and it was flat and the audience was standing there in the arena going what the fuck is going on here and I don't know who could have envisioned that it would be good. Uh, but but no, if they want to, if if they want to make a star, give Jungle Boy to Jericho again. Maybe do a two or three week little fucking program on television, and then finally get some fucking heat on Jungle Boy and and sympathy for whoever the fuck it is Jericho is going to work with on the next pay per view. I can't even remember at this point. God damn it. Moxley. That's it. Moxley. Is there it you Moxley? For, I think it's Moxley. Well, okay, for Moxley to come out and save Jungle Boy in the end. But you've, you, you've got a guy who knows what he's doing uh, with a kid who can get over when led. We saw that. Jericho led him by the nose every step of the way through that fucking match. But he has the appearance and physical charisma with the audience and the goodwill to get sympathy and have people behind him. And they bought some near falls. That's the way you make a star. You've got to have the proper material and the and then the, the proper artist to sculpt it. There was none of that in the main event that they delivered. So they can make stars and they have people there that can do it. And Cody can do the same thing. But what the fucking fuck? What in the flying fucking fuck? What in the flying French fried fucking fuck was that last segment? I, you know, so maybe they'll have Christmas for the fucking elves from the North Pole to bring them Eddie Graham down one of the Bucks chimneys and Bill Watts down the other one. Maybe they can slap some fucking sense into their smarmy little faces. Where do you think Tony Khan ranks on the list of money marks in the past? Like there was obviously Dixie Carter. What was the guy from the uh, AWF, Paul Alperstein? Uh, yes, he's the, he paid... A thousand people, fifty dollars each in like nineteen. What was it? Ninety one, ninety two. Oh no, it was after that. It was like nineteen ninety five, probably. Okay, well, because uh, he wanted to get Tito Santana on the um, Super Bowl of wrestling. That's why I remember that. Okay, well, uh, did he? Yeah, you what? talked about it at the time. He called you. Did up I? <laughs> and he said, okay. "Can we get our world champion Tito Santana <laughs> on the show?" And you said. It was nothing against Tito, but it was too close to the show. You had already advertised the whole show. You couldn't add another title match all of a sudden out of nowhere. You know what? You know what, son of a bitch? You remember things I don't. I've never thought of that since. But anyway, well, yeah, but he he paid a, a thousand people $50 each to be the audience for his television taping so it would look like he had a big professional organization and paid a bunch of <laughs> guys. Uh, what, uh, Slaughter was involved and. Tito and anyway, 
Nevertheless, um, Gordon Scazzari, you can add him to the list. Oh, good God. But, but no, Gordon Scazzari spent a lot of money for a, like a 21 year old kid, apparently in ill health and mentally and physically who had just gotten an inheritance from his family. Tony Khan's in a whole nother world of Gordon Scazzari. I mean, but I saw Gordon Scazzari at that, at that one taping in Massachusetts that me and Stan went to, and he paid me double because I was supposed to do color. But then I got there, I said, well, where's the announce position? They said, oh, we forgot to set one of those up, so we're just going to bring you back and have you do it later. Don't worry, I'll pay you again. <laughs> that never happened, by the way. <laughs> but he had a pack of checks in his hand with no checkbook and no register and no not recording them, just writing out checks to fucking guys when they would come in and say, oh, I, I was supposed to have this, or I did this, or you promised me this, or my goddamn dry cleaning, or whatever the fuck. And uh, it was it was insane, but still, no, he didn't spend as much money. And I think he ran two nights. Uh, he didn't spend as much money as Tony Khan is spending on one of his executive vice presidents. Well, you weren't around Alperstein, but you were around Dixie and you were around Gordon Scazzari. And we are certainly hearing a lot of things from people, even people in that company about Tony Khan. Is there a similar trait in terms of, I mean, I'm not saying you have to be aloof with the guys who work for you, but, you know, does Vince McMahon hang out with the wrestlers outside of the venue? Did Bill Watts hang well, out with the wrestlers? Should a yes, guy yes. running the company? Well, no, wait, 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 wait now. Vince McMahon, yes. Don't you remember there's a famous story, dared the Hart Foundation to give him their finish in the fucking bar <laughs> back in the 80s. He, he grew out of it as he saw that, that instances like that were probably not good. And, and he, but he, Vince always still, and to this day wants to be viewed as if not one of the boys, actually one of the boys, one of the top guys, he wants to be in that fucking club. Right. But he has the ability to separate if a business from, you know, not pleasure, but business from social and uh, more than anybody else in the world, probably. I mean, Vince would fire is, is he's like Donald Trump. He's like, I've said a cultured, intelligent, more reasonably honest Donald Trump. He would fire a, a, even a family member if he needed to. Uh, and then they still expect a president at Christmas because, well, it's just business pal, but he's also smart and he's also been around the business since he was very young. And he's also had pitfalls and uh, fucked up at times. And he is high in the ranking for the guy that killed the fucking wrestling business, but he's also high in the rankings for greatest promoter that ever fucking lived both at the same time. So, you know, and yes, he has his picadillos, but with Dixie, it was different. Dixie was different than Tony Khan. She, Dixie was just, I think, obviously wanted to be a star on some type of television program. She was still pitching the fucking Housewives of Nashville idea or whatever the fuck. She, you know, she <laughs> she would have makeup put on to go sit with the fans and hold the title belt in the impact zone. She didn't want to be in wrestling. She just wanted to be on television. So they were able to play to that in the closing waning years to increase the stretch that fucking business out a little bit. Um, but even, her problem was she didn't know anything about wrestling. So she believed the wrong people that were telling her things um, is and as such as her irrational support of shit stain. But she didn't meddle in creative past the point of meddling in who should be in charge of creative. But she, it wasn't like she was in any way or ever thought that she was going to write these storylines or come up, you know, blah, blah, past, past an idea. Well, you ought to push Hernandez as something or whatever the fuck. Well, I was talking more I'm, about socializing, actually. Well but, well, but hold on. I'm afraid that Tony Khan is wholeheartedly on board with who knows what. I don't know whether he's on board with the good shit or the bad shit, but I have a feeling he's wholeheartedly on board with some of this shit because maybe some of this shit might not be happening if he wasn't wholeheartedly on board with it. I don't know. Some of this shit is his shit. Well, that's the problem. We don't know whose shit. See, when, when you've got a booker for good or bad, at least you know whose shit it is. But when, when there's... Uh, when there's people in charge of various things and, you know, uh, I don't know what the 
the the office titles are maybe there is only one booker but there's obviously multiple people in charge of this show because it's schizophrenic uh, but as far as socializing I don't think I don't know that Dixie would have ever even gone so far as to go for giving somebody a stunner. I don't now. Now somebody will come up with footage of Dixie giving somebody a stunner, but I I don't fucking know. Well, eventually she became an on-air character. You're specifically talking about, I guess, before she was an on-air character. Well, yeah. Well, and they ain't got that far yet here because that is the 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 fucking last hail mary of uh when when guys that have milked somebody. And this is, it's been this way for the past fucking, well, since there's been television and even before that, you know, you, you put your front man over in public and in newspapers and et cetera. When somebody finds an angel, as Burt Prentice would say, cause he has those carny roots, then angel is an investor. When you find an angel to open up Pittsburgh, you found a money man to bankroll you run in the city of Pittsburgh. They've found an angel. Problem is the wrong people found the angel because they don't know what they're fucking doing and the angel shouldn't be expected to know. And the angel should be kept out of any wrestling business decisions as much as possible. Almost everybody knows that because elsewise you head down that fucking road to ruin even quicker. But when the, when the wrestling people don't know what they're doing... And the angel starts turning around going, wait a minute, I'm losing a lot of money here. Maybe somebody that fucking Buck Robley met down at the track. I'm losing a lot of money here. The Elvis impersonator in New Orleans. Well, hey, you need to go on television and be my manager. We'll get some heat on you and then we'll switch your baby face. And you'll give out fucking free tickets to the wrestling matches to the kids and you'll be a big hero around town. It'll take all the heat off of you. You've gotten your fucking crooked businesses. So they put the angel on television, make the angel a star, and then the angel agrees to fucking give out some more wings. This is not new. But what if the angel has read The Observer for 20 years and thinks they know better than the average fan? Nick Goulas promoted wrestling for 40 years, and he still thought his son George should be a wrestler. There's always a blind spot. Do you think that potentially this angel will get to a point where he says, you know what? I've been fleeced. I think I need to contact an attorney. No. No, I do not. I think that this angel will get a message from the front office signed by God, a.k.a. Daddy. This says, what the <laughs> fuck are you doing with my empire? <laughs> and that's when somebody will be called... Somebody will be called to sue, sue, sue. Call Stephen P. News. If you need to sue. An outlaw. Show or two. The rest. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the man who thought that it had been so long into the program that we'd forgot about him by now. The law offices of Stephen P. New at newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. If you have had an offspring that has that has frivolously disseminated away the family fortune, and you want to get even with him. Call Stephen P. New, or if you're addicted to opioids, or have a family member that uh, is addicted to opioids, or have a a family member who's had a baby born addicted to opioids, call Stephen P. New. If you have had any issue with a major corporation, a greedy, avaricious entity putting their thumb on you and putting the twist and the screws to you, and you had no recourse and no no one to defend you until now. Now you have a champion of justice, even if it's just some outlaw mud show guy that just can't get the fucking picture and you have to fucking sue him under the goddamn courthouse to get him to understand that you just can't frivolously try to, you don't pull on Superman's cape. You don't piss in the wind. You don't pull the mask off the old Lone Ranger. And most importantly, you do not tell Stephen P. New to go piss off. Because you will get sued. 
You can have this titan of justice, this baron of the barristers, the consigliere of the cult of cornet on your side, ladies and gentlemen, by calling 888-692-8084 or emailing newlawoffice.com. And I'm sure the listeners will be hearing from Stephen in January on the experience with an update on what he's been doing on behalf of the cult of cornet. And boy, he does a great job. What a great guy, Stephen Pinu. And, and in, in, in all honesty, he has taken many more cases from the cult members than just mine that, that we publicize here on the air. Of course, we don't get into people's personal legal matters, but he has uh, had a number of uh, cases from cult of cornet members and uh, resolved so far from what I hear to their satisfaction. 888-692-8084, newlawoffice.com. But Jim, we actually have some questions. that were We do? This week, we do. I thought we were about done. Well, this first one was sent in on Twitter using the hashtag corny drive through from Pete Boyle. What are your thoughts on Enzo Amore attempting to call out Tamatanga? Oh. Okay, well, you you got to tell me, you got to fill me in on the background. I've seen this promo, and we'll talk about it. But um, it, it, this is is this him him trying to shoot his own angle? Is this a match that's going to take place somewhere, or did he just decide? What is the backstory on why the, there is an issue between Enzo and Tama Tonga? I don't know for sure because, like most of wrestling, I've ignored Ring of Honor for a good deal of time. But I believe. It was during the match with Tamatanga and his brother at the Ring of Honor New Japan Madison Square Garden show last April. Remember, if you remember, there was a big controversy because they had Enzo okay, and yeah, Cass they, run it, in. it was a it was a shoot angle where they jumped the rail and they weren't supposed to be there, but people found out it was an angle and they universally shit on it because nobody likes Enzo and fucking Cass, right? I believe, and again, someone could correct me if I'm wrong, because I haven't followed this closely. I believe that maybe Tamatanga was one of the people not in on it, and he was one of the people in the match. Oh, oh yeah, okay. Well, then, <laughs> you know, I the only time that anybody ever busted into anything I was doing, and and I didn't know about it, um, was in Dallas at, at my last night in world class. In uh, the Tarrant County Convention Center in Fort Worth, actually, 1985 is Fourth of July. It was my match with Sunshine, right? Or my my challenge because the Texas Commission wouldn't actually let us advertise a match between a man and a woman. So, the challenge was that, uh, you know, we were doing the women's lib thing, and I'd fucking, you know, uh, give her all the goddamn pots and pans and rattling the pots and pans around in the kitchen bullshit and everything, right? And the time comes, I said, you couldn't even knock me off my feet if I was blindfolded with my hands behind my back. So the deal was I'd be blindfolded, have my hands behind my back, and she would have one shot to knock me off my feet, and then I could do anything I wanted to sunshine. So that was the the fucking premise. And of course, the referee gets distracted, and here comes Kabuki. I'm standing there, thinks it's sunshine. He gives me the fucking thrust kick, knocks me ass over tea kettle, fucking jumps out. The referee turns around. I'm laying there. What the fuck? <laughs> Sunshine's standing over me. They ring the bell. I take the hood off, and there she is. And I'm like, how? Oh, what the fuck? Like, she knocked me the fuck out, right? People actually paid to see this. It was because of the promos. But right as we're going into the thing and setting up the premise of this deal, all of a sudden, in the ring comes Chris Adams. <clears throat> and he starts cutting a promo about how he he had already wrestled. He was leaving the fucking convention center when suddenly Bruiser Brody leaped out in front of his car and broke his windshield with a fucking chain or something. Well, of course, Bruiser Brody was not even in the state of Texas. It was goddamn deal they were shooting because they were br- going to you know, bring him back in the territory, right? But... He says that, and they're, oh, and, and, and we're going to do this and that and the other thing. He cuts his promo and gets out. I'm like, what the fuck? We had already started our fucking setup. And come to find out the reason later on was they said, well, we were afraid we'd run out of TV time, and we wanted to send Chris out to make that announcement. I said, had the television time shortened 
in the time, the four minutes that you sent us out there till you decided to do this, because I was hot, right? They broke up the fucking flow of our deal. So that's why I cussed them. That's actually the first time I cussed the office out. I cussed them all out, and I said, that's why we're already fighting. The Midnight Express were in the Omni that night. I'd agreed to come back and do this. I said, it's kind of bullshit. It's why we're fucking in Atlanta, and, and we'll be over there on national TV. Thank you very much. But anyway, I can understand if Tamatonga had an angle go on in his match and was pissed about it. Did he say something about Enzo to then provoke this? Because why is Enzo calling Tamatonga out? Well, they have gone back and forth on Twitter. I don't know who started it. I don't know when it started, but it seems to be happening more frequently as of late. Okay, well, anyway, here's my thoughts. I watched one of the promos where Enzo is on the fucking beach, right? Or some is is that a beach? You saw it. Is it a beach? Is it a, he's out out in he was in, in, the snow. in public? The one I saw, he was in the snow. Was that snow? All right, I was I thought it was sand <laughs> in Wyoming. Okay. What beach is oh, in wait, Wyoming? Oh no, wait, wait, yeah, that's right. He said it's a little nipply out here. Okay, he's out in the snow. <laughs> that's right. All right, beach. whatever the fuck. Well, I was. It was a small little screen there. Uh, but anyway, the point is, I was watching him because it's a close up of his face because he's fucking shooting at himself with the goddamn the selfie stick, right? Or he's just reaching out and he's got the camera or the phone in his hand. Correct. There is no cameraman. I believe so. Cause it's right up on him. The promo was incredible. Apparently that's why he got the job in the first place because he can talk his ass off and he's full of bullshit. And it's just that line of bullshit that it's colorful fucking talk, right? People like that kind of shit. That's the essence of wrestling. But apparently he's also a real fucking lunatic and just, and that's why that they fucking all hated him and couldn't wait to get rid of him. But the promo itself, besides the fact, you know what to me was off putting about the promo? He's looking to the right of the, of the camera lens. He's looking at his hand holding the camera or something. Did you get that? Did you notice that? I did notice that. I wasn't sure if it was because of the glare of the sun off the snow or why, but well, I didn't notice that. No, it wasn't glare of the sun. He could have fucking turned 15 degrees and he wouldn't have had the goddamn glare. He was looking to the right off camera. I think at where he was holding, he was looking at his hand, but the fucking camera lens on the phone is right on the end of it. But it was so close that it looks like he's looking two feet off the off camera one of those type of deals when you go try to do your selfie but you're looking at your hand instead of the fucking lens on the camera anyway it was off-putting to me but otherwise than that it was fabulous i i gotta say i'm pretty sure he wrote it down and memorized it first to be quite honest with you but so i, I have to take a point or two off for that but otherwise because it was just it was too quick with too much you know, as they used to say, jive bullshit, you know, just the, the fucking clever lines and the fucking bing, bing, the patter. Uh, but, but he's, he wanted to be a rapper, right? So he probably writes lyrics. So he probably wrote it down and memorized it. But so I have to take a point or two off for that. But otherwise it no, but nobody else really could have written that memorized it and then delivered it like that. So it's still fucking freaking awesome. But I, the, 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 the true, Artful promo should be off the top of the head. He's obviously very, very talented on the mic, and you can use that in a number of ways to get people to either care about you or maybe, in this case, to get people to want to see you get your ass kicked. But if someone is a problem backstage, if someone constantly has problems with the people they work with, if management doesn't like them, what do you do with that person who exhibits the talent, not necessarily the in-ring talent, but the talent of being able to talk people potentially into the building what do you do with that do you give up and just say it's not worth it or do you try to find a way to harness that well no you b both at at whatever point either one becomes necessary it, it just buddy landell many times was a pain in the ass to people in the locker room but it, it, but he had so much talent uh, but then there always came a time where it just, you know, fuck, buddy, you can't sing Moon River in the fucking I Quit match just because you hate Horner. You know, he's a fucking goof. We know this, but you exposed the business. Um, you yeah, know, so real, real you, quick, real quick. Did you know they hated each other when you booked them in a program against each other? 
Well, I don't know if – I don't even think that they hated each other. I think Buddy was just disgusted with Horner, as, as everybody got to be sooner or later, but also he thought it was beneath him. And this was <clears> – <throat> I was trying to, and that was 92 rather than 95. The 95 buddy, we immediately put on top because as we've talked about before, good buddy had come back and, and he was there and you could trust him and he made it through the whole fucking year. But you know, the 92 buddy was, we got to, you know, check buddy out and see, I wasn't going to put him on fucking top and, and it, he didn't last, but he thought Horner was beneath, beneath him to do that program <laughs> which, you know, if buddy, if good buddy or bad buddy had been good buddy, Horner would have been beneath him. I wouldn't have put him there. So the the point is, you know, the locker room was always full of fucking outrageous guys. And, you, you know, in some respect, all of them were, that's why you were in wrestling or why you used to get in wrestling business because you didn't want to be a normal person. Um, and you had some special talent that, that, you know, you didn't have to be. Um, so you always tried to, if somebody was useful, you know, figure out a way to tolerate them and point them toward their best fucking efforts. But at some point, you know, if you had to do something, you had to do something. But Enzo, as much heat as I've heard that, you know, he had with the boys, I think, you know, even though he was that great of a promo, <clears throat> especially in a company that big, you, you know, you just can't put up with somebody that has struck almost everybody in the locker room that way. It's, it's, it's got to be him at that point. And now having said this also, is Tama Tonga in on this? Or is was he, if he was really pissed at Enzo that he was in an angle in their match and he said something or whatever the fuck, is he still pissed at Enzo for real? Because if he is, it, it, what is Enzo trying to do? If he's trying to work himself into a match and the Samoan is pissed, good God, who the fuck wants to fight a pissed off Samoan? It, I mean, it, it, or Tongan. It, it, or Tongan. Well, uh, whatever the case may be, if he's a member of the family, <laughs> if he's one of the island boys, the last thing you would want to do is piss him off for real. And then even if, if some promotion said, well, we could make money with this and then book it, he would fucking kill Enzo working with him. My God. Uh, so I don't know what can be gained by that. The last thing you want to do is piss off any of the, whatever Island that they're from uh, if, members of the family. Good God. And going back to Enzo and his talent on the mic, obviously he behaved well enough then he went from NXT to the main roster. He got called up. Then there are various issues that some people have. But again, going back to him and his talent on the mic, what do you do with someone like that? Well, I mean, in in what way? is Are we still acting like he's a wrestler? Because he was kind of the shits at that, wasn't he? Or do, do we, what do you mean? Do we make him a manager? He's good on the microphone, but here's the thing. He's only good on the microphone with his line of bullshit being him. So he can't be an announcer. He would distract. He can't, he can be a manager, but he would have, it would have to be a manager where he had the majority of the heat, kind of like me, and his boys protected him because it, in, especially in his case, all of his bullshit is pretty much all about him. It's, he has to be him. He can't be anybody else. So that's the way you'd have to use him. Our next question, Jim, is one that was sent in by many people. I haven't been following WWF TV or WWE TV closely enough to know about this, but apparently it's happening because many people have sent it in. I'll sum them up. What do you think about the fact that the WWE is apparently trying to turn the revival into a comedy act? Some have said a spoof of the fabulous ones. What? Do you think this is punishment for Wait, them? what? What? They're, have they spoofed the fabs? I don't know. I, I unfortunately have not seen this, and I'm a big fan of the revival. Maybe it's good that I haven't seen this, but <laughs> we've gotten about six questions in the last three days asking about the WWE turning the revival into a comedy act. I, well, I, I, is it like, well, we'll just fucking bury you since you won't resign? I don't know. I would assume that would be what it would be because they, 
they're about as good at, at being comedy wrestlers as I would be at building the next fucking lunar rocket. Um, so I don't know, but if anybody's got pictures of them in the fucking spangly fabs, tuxedos and top hats, I'd like to see those. When you, I, were, I don't know what to say. When you were there, did Vince, would Vince do that kind of thing? If someone's contract was coming up? Well, I don't know how many guys refused to renew. I mean, obviously razor and diesel went to WCW and they really didn't get, they, they were allowed to do a curtain call, but were there any cases? Well, well, guys- but also they 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 milked that down to the bare nub as well. You'll remember they both told Vince in person that they were going to re-sign and stick with him at the TV tapings out in the Midwest. I think it was Iowa. And then we all got back to Connecticut, and two days later, Vince got faxes from each one of them saying, "Well, actually, we're going to quit." Um, and so that was pretty close to the, but he didn't bury him anyway. No. <clears throat> uh, you know, most of the guys resigned if they had the option to resign in those days. Uh, but even the ones that were leaving to go, it, a lot of times it went to go to WCW. A lot of times it went down to the nub and it depended on the person. Sometimes Vince was burying guys that wanted to stay just because he didn't see, you know, it's not like he said, I'm going to fuck with this guy and bury him. He just gave him stupid gimmicks because he didn't see anything and didn't give a fuck. He just wanted to, you know, populate the card, put something on him, you know. Ah. So he didn't really, you know, no, there was not, there was not this level of punitiveness, I guess. To I, They don't like it when people won't resign, but at the same time, that's the oldest trick in the wrestling book. If you, if a guy's finishing up, you know, then you beat him on the way out. But that's it. when there were territories, you were only beating a guy in Louisiana. You weren't beating him in all 50 states and, you know, Canada. And I, even I always thought that it, it was a little much to try to get a bunch of jobs out of somebody leaving. Of course, in the territory days, once again, the last two, you gave your two-week notice, you worked seven nights a week, you'd do 14 jobs because you'd put somebody over every night, but it wasn't on television. It was in the houses, so you actually only, you got beaten Baton Rouge and New Orleans and whatever the fuck, right? So that's what guys did. But on, especially when you've got a top guy that's leaving, I always thought one high-profile job to pass the torch and maybe one secondary job to help out a, 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 a younger guy that you want to elevate is all you want to get out of a top guy. Because any more than that, then people see it for what it is. He's just beaten because he's leaving. And and also then it, it even if they don't even know wrestling's a work, it takes the special off of, oh my God, so-and-so beat Bruno. That's unheard of until three more people do it the next fucking week. And then you're like, oh, shit, well, I guess it didn't mean that much. So, yeah, if an underneath guy is leaving, you beat the piss out of him on the way out because, you know, in every match, one side has to lose. It's not, you know, but if you have a star, if you have a guy that you'd like to come back to work for you in your same territory, um, don't completely devalue him on the way out unless there's been bad, bad feelings. Uh, ill will, bad blood, if you will. And then, you know, a lot of fucking guys, I'll fix this motherfucker, beat the fuck out of him, right? We'll make, if you don't want the guy to ever come back because he's done something that fucking pissy, we'll make sure everybody in the fucking territory knows that my grandmother could beat this fucking guy. Fuck him. It just depends. What do you think of the recent... I guess they're now five-year contracts. Were there any five-year contracts when you were there? What do you think of the fact that they're now getting guys to re-sign for five years? Well, that's crazy. Um, no, they're, they're, well, they're, there were whatever Vince wanted there to be. They signed Mark Henry for 10 years as a rookie. Um, and I'm pretty sure that, you know, uh, some of the top guys, well, and remember Brett's was 20 years, but it only lasted a year and a half. Some of the top guys maybe had three or five years or whatever, but no, not just everybody on the roster. They, you, it, you're you crazy to do to agree to do anything for the same amount of money or even an escalating amount of money for five years unless you just think, okay, this is the last thing I want to do, so I'll just take all this money and be done with it. Cause you never know what's going to happen in five years. That would make me just frightened as fuck. But, um, but then you run the risk of them 
saying, all right, well, then we'll make sure my gra- everybody knows my grandmother can beat you on the way out if you don't sign for five years. It's uh, <sighs> That's why I wish that, you know, uh, there would be an, an option, of an alternative that uh, reasonably well run and professional so that guys would be able to have uh, uh, options and not have to be strong armed into signing away uh, five years of their life. But I also recognize when it's pie in the sky to think that something's going to be that when you obviously can recognize all the things that are going to go wrong. Our next question was sent in via email to corny drive through at gmail.com. From Jonathan in Nova Scotia. Hello, Jim. I'm curious about the WWF involvement with the television show Boy Meets World. (laughs) Vader appeared on the show several times, but one episode titled 16 Candles and a 400 pound, excuse me, and 400 pound men clearly featured footage from a WWF house show match between Vader and Jake the Snake. The episode would have been filmed in 1996 when Jim was Vader's manager, but sadly, the episode features brother love instead of James E. Cornette. (laughs) My questions are, where was this particular house show? Was Jim present for the filming? Were there any complications between the WWF and non-wrestling cast and crew? I uh, no, I wasn't there. I don't, I, I wasn't even there. It was Owen. I wasn't even there as Davey would say. Um, no, the, apparently the premise of the show, w- w- the kid was a fucking wrestling fan, right? Or cause I never watched the fucking show. Either did I. Uh, but uh, they did have some kind of, re- the kid was a fan or somebody in the family or whatever the fuck. And they had Vader on a couple of times. Uh, there was some tie that him specifically too. I can't remember because I, as I said, I didn't watch the show. <clears throat> and, um, obviously since it was a television show, um, you know, on a network station, Vince agreed to, uh, to work with them and, you know, give them what they wanted because it was publicity and they're going to, you know, them as the premier wrestling thing. So Vince would have no trouble with that. Even if I was managing Leon at that, at that time, I didn't go on the road to the house shows. So I wouldn't have been there and don't think I was there. And, but I guarantee you that because Bruce being brother love, was he the manager? It made no sense. But what probably happened was Bruce as a producer was sent to work with the network muckety mucks to make sure they got what they wanted and took his outfit and went and managed <laughs> to get in the shot. I bet you, I bet you because brother love was nowhere around the WWF in 1996, but, but Bruce Pritchard would have been assigned if there was going to be some TV network shooting some footage, he would have been assigned probably to go and, and stooge. So that's probably what happened. But that that was probably the only time that brother love ever managed Vader. I did not even know about this, to be honest with you. When you were there, did Bruce ever, or potentially often try to pitch a brother love return? No, he didn't pitch Brother Love Returns. He just told loving, longing stories of how over Brother Love was at one time. But he he wasn't pitching returns. He would not have turned down a return, but he didn't pitch them. He was smart enough not to pitch them. Okay, well, our next question was sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from Matt Carr. In a recent interview, Austin Aries said he thinks Jim doesn't like him because he described Jim's version of Ring of Honor as Smoky Mountain of Honor. He added that he liked Smoky Mountain and was not insulting Jim or Smoky Mountain Wrestling at all, and he even apologized. (laughs) Is there any truth to this story? Well, there is truth to the story that that's what he said. That's not true that that is the reason I dislike him. Uh, That's like just another brick in the wall. Uh, but no, we've talked about, here's the thing, Aries doesn't get it. He's like a lot of these fucking, and you'd be surprised now, the most opinionated and or uh, insufferable douchebag of wrestlers are the independent wrestlers that have, the, the guys in the big companies are are humble and lovable. 
and thankful to be there. And the fucking independents are the ones that all want to fucking change the world or organize unions or fucking make sure that wrestling is inclusive for everyone. So, you know, we'll all just wrestle fucking small school children and, you know, uh, uh, 100-pound females or whatever the fuck. Um, And Aries was one of the pioneers of that. He's just a miserable prick in the locker room. He's the kind of guy that despite the fact, and this has been borne out by all these companies, despite the fact that he has great wrestling matches, he's never going to be the top guy in a major company, Um, not even if he had a good attitude. But he has great wrestling matches, especially for the Ring of Honor style or the current, you know, modern style of wrestling. He has great fucking matches, and he can talk pretty well but he causes more trouble in your locker room with getting people fucking discontented and just fucking, he's just, people get weary of him complaining and bitching and griping about his own shit and everybody else's shit to begin with. And he's never happy anywhere as has been evidenced by, you know, he's worked more places in a third of the time than I have. It's taken me almost 40 years to go through every company. He did it in like fucking 10. The line Smoky Mountain of Honor, which is a pretty stupid way of doing that. I think if you were going to combine them, it may not be Smoky but, Mountain of Honor. But did that piss you off when he said it? Well, yeah, because he said it in a derisive way because he, well, he wants us to go back, you know, go backwards to when the product was good. A man made sense and was more logical and didn't cater to whiny little bitches. Um, you know, that's terrible, but it was his way of saying, well, this is not, this is not new. This is not modern. This is old fashioned shit. It, it, unfortunately, um, you know, Roderick Strong, Eddie Edwards, and Davey Richards, although Davey had his own issues with his level of commitment to wrestling at various times, the Briscoes, all those guys flourished in that environment because they worked hard and were working for the good of the company instead of the good of themselves. Um, is Austin, Austin, Richards Austin, still in wrestling? I actually no, no, I haven't thought it, about it, him in a while. No, he he quit, and as I believe, at last I've heard, he did become a fireman and EMT type of person, as he was going to do. Um, but anyway, it, it, because of their level of commitment to getting the company over rather than themselves, Austin Aries couldn't couldn't hang around and and get involved in the Sinclair era because he was a miserable fucking whiny little bitch. And Delirious and I asked him to give us an opportunity to address some of his concerns without making the whole locker room miserable, and he refused to do it. So we discontinued booking his miserable ass. And he didn't get to be involved in Sinclair and et cetera, where some people have flourished since then. And that's probably what he's mad about. But uh, all those other guys that were younger than him in some cases, or at least his same age, that were on the roster at that time flourished because under Smoky Mountain of Honor, because they weren't pains in the ass, except for guys like Steen and Jericho, who notice a common Generico, theme here. Not Jericho. Or uh, did I say Jericho? You Steen and Jericho. Generico. Yeah. Who were pains in the ass to deal with, and we didn't have time for problem children when we were making major changes and shit like the ownership of the company. And didn't have time to cater like a, a small independent would to certain guys because they had talents in some ways, but were complete pains in the ass and were standing in the way of the bigger picture. And that's another thing that independent level wrestlers who have never run companies or booked companies or worked at high levels fail to understand, which is why now I'm sure they've got the same thing in all elite wrestling. High maintenance motherfuckers. That's a pain in the ass when you're trying to do something. How many of these guys that have openly complained about you, thinking about Aries, and now it's opening, I'm thinking about Cole Cabana, Young Bucks, were guys that were fans of Jim Cornette, and then Jim Cornette said, we don't have a place for you right now, and then all of a sudden they hate Jim Cornette. Well, I don't know, but if they were fans of Jim Cornette, why would they do everything that Jim Cornette would tell a wrestler not to fucking do? Our next question Sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from Randy Albertini in Ottawa, Canada. That sounds like something on the menu over at fucking Outback. The Albertini. 
I'm a 65 year old fart. I had a grandpa who loved wrestling and used the excuse of taking me to the shows in Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada. So I've been a fan since the age of six. I faithfully listen to both your podcasts and I'm upset when they drop late. (laughs) I have an oddball question for you. Boogie Woogie Man Jimmy Valiant had a series of battles with Paul Jones and I believe the team called the Assassins. I believe it was in the NWA. This led to the villain shaving off his beard. If my memory serves me correctly, Jimmy Valiant... The villain. (laughs) The villain. (laughs) If my memory serves me correctly, Jimmy Valiant got revenge when he beat them, forcing them to unmask. Here's my question. From what I understand, he loved his long hair and bushy beard. Being a person who has had a beard for many years, I know how you love it. (laughs) To get me to allow someone (laughs) to shave it would cost, and he has $5 signs here. (laughs) used to be five stars, now it's $5 signs. Do you know, or can you give an educated opinion as to how much the booker had to pay to get Jimmy Valiant to allow this to happen? From what I've read about Jimmy, I can't see him doing it, for nothing or just a few bucks. Oh, well, no, there was not just nothing or a few bucks involved. I don't know what the exact payoff was, but that's what, when he was starting to formulate the question, it took a while to get there. I was going to say something that Jimmy loved even more than his beard. And that was money, Jack. Woo. Must say, um, and no, it, 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 that is, it, it, that's the, uh, first of all, it was Paul Jones was the villain uh, Paul managed uh, the assassins who at that time in mid Atlantic were uh, that was Jody and Hercules Hernandez. Correct. In 80, in 83, 84, 83 yeah. to 84 because Hercules came directly from the Carolinas. That's the one that unmasked. I don't think they unmasked Jody. I think they unmasked Hercules and then he left and came into mid South. And that's where I started managing him. He still had one of his, old assassin mask that's when i got my head shaved he gave that to me i took a black sharpie and colored in the fucking because it was a last minute deal i didn't have a mask laying around imagine that um but anyway um yeah handsome there was a famous time in memphis where they couldn't come up with enough money to get him to shave his head and they advertised it anyway because lawler thought well we'll we'll get out of it and blah 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 and and it was going to be hair versus hair, Lawler and Valiant, and and Valiant Pearl harbored Lawler from behind before the match started. Lawler couldn't continue, and Jerry thought that the people would be so sympathetic, they wouldn't want to see him get his hair cut, but instead they rioted and set shit on fire because nobody got their hair cut. <laughs> so that, but uh, he wasn't going to shave his head at the time, especially when he was hot in those years. But as it got so hot in the Carolinas. The idea of shaving the beard was perfect to set up a hair match. So the concept was not as much they paid him to shave his beard in the angle as much as the promise was there of what was was that a Starcade match or was that when they did the Boogie Jam 84 when they did a whole tour around? You know what? There was so much because at one point he lost his hair. He lost his beard. Paul Jones lost his hair. I think Paul Jones may have lost his hair at Starcade 86, I think. Yes, yes. Um, But at, at any rate, that's the thing. When the Carolinas was making so much money at the time and Handsome was so over and he was figured in, and especially, you know, if Dusty gives him this this run, right, this idea, okay, here's what we're going to do, baby. You you know, we're going to clip your beard to get the heat, but then you're going to be in this run, and you're going to have the Boogie Jam 84 tour where you work on top in all these towns, and then you're going to be figured into this in Starcade and uh, blah, 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 and Handsome could see the money. So basically he was getting paid for the big matches where he would get revenge by getting his, his beard cut. I don't even know that they paid him Actually, here, here's a, here's your check for Spartanburg, wherever they cut the fucking beard, right? An extra $500 because we cut your beard, but he was figured into matches where the payoffs would be thousands of dollars going forward for a long period of time with that. And Dusty was smart enough to see that even though Handsome at that point was in the twilight of his in-ring physical career and the gimmick 
limited even what he was able to do before because pe people don't remember 10 years before that as one of the Valiant brothers, the heel, and he was lean and he was in shape and he'd dive out of the ring over the top rope like Heenan used to do, running from the the baby face. And, you know, he did a lot of more shit, but the gimmick didn't call for that. So Dusty realized, I've got this fucking guy that's over like God is one of my top baby faces. I don't have to put a title on him because he's not that kind of guy. He's just going to be over regardless. As long as I put him on TV to talk and beat somebody in 60 seconds, then, uh, you know, and, and contain his Paul Jones was the perfect manager. Cause he could, he wasn't tying up. I hate to say this, but about Paul, but if, he wasn't tying up me or JJ Dillon with handsome Jimmy in a program. Paul Jones's reason for being as a manager for that two year period of time was to be the foil for Jimmy Valiant, who was so over. And most of his guys were there at that time to be the foil for Jimmy Valiant, who was so over. And then you kept the somewhat questionable in ring quality of the matches to the same match on a fucking card. <clears throat> and, and then the horsemen and the midnight and the rock and roll and the dusty and magnum, we, we'd all go do our thing. But because Jimmy was so over, he had to keep feeding him fucking heels, Dusty did, as a booker. He would have been stupid not to. And then finally, the downfall was when Handsome Jimmy had finally run his course, and they tried to make Paul Jones a top manager and put the belts on like Rude and Manny and, you know, through 87 and into 80. When Paul, after he had that reason for being, that's when everybody said, ooh, Paul Jones is not really a very good fucking manager. You know, cause he was a big star as a wrestler, but, you know, it, it didn't translate. Did you get a bonus when you got your head shaved? Did you give Chris Candido a bonus when, well, you attempted to shave his head? You know, well, yeah. cut? <laughs> I mean, how did that work in other places? <laughs> no, I, I was I was basically just hornswoggled. Um, I got uh, my payoff for being in the main event in New Orleans, and they just told me they were going to shave my head. And then, uh, then that whole fucking thing went south. And, uh... No, with with Chris, uh, I fell victim to the same thing that happened to Lawler and thought we could get by with a little Zabada as long as the heel did get their head shaved. But uh, but no, he agreed to do it for the because it, it wasn't that far off anyway from what he was wearing to begin with. But uh, I, I, all of those things made me sour on head shaving. Now, having said that, uh for the big main event uh, of Dundee getting his head shaved in Memphis and then his wife getting Beverly getting her head shaved the next week. From what I understand, they got six grand for those two matches alone in 1977 because they sold out to mid South Coliseum and it was the capper of a record setting program between Lawler and Dundee. So that was the down payment on their first house in Hendersonville, I believe. And $6,000 in 1977 is what, 25 grand a day or whatever for two matches. That wasn't bad. Our next question sent in on Twitter using the hashtag corny drive through is from Mr. Gray Sky. I'm sure the rules that Jim gave about what a heel can and can't do don't apply to monster heel wrestlers. Since they can't be believable chicken shits, they must require a whole other set of rules to get over. Could you detail a few of those? Well, now what now? Well, you talked about how on the show heels, you know, they need to cheat. They need to be the chicken shit. They need well, to do things behind the baby face's back. How does that change if it's a monster? Or behind, or behind the referee's back. Uh, behind the referee's um, back, yeah. Well, no, they do need to cheat, but it chicken shit heels cheat in a different way than monster heels. Monster heels don't care about the rules and don't think the referee has the power to enforce them, so they just break them right out. But the chicken shit heel cheats because he's... You got chicken shit and cause he's losing and, and but still there there's cheating. It just needs to be cheating related to the personality and lying and being, you know, unsavory, a monster heel um, in a lot of cases has the manager to do the chicken shit stuff because there has to be ultimately some vulnerability in a heel somehow or elsewise he becomes a baby face. Uh, remember when they found out Andre was scared of snakes or, 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 or Yokozuna was scared of coffins because there has to be some vulnerability. Um, but you know, a, a lot of times, as I said, the manager would, 
you know, would uh, 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 carry the chicken shit part of things. But any uh, the road warriors, the reason why they became baby faces, because you couldn't beat them. They didn't sell anything. They always won. And, uh, you know, how can you boo somebody like that? And they didn't really cheat because they didn't know how to fucking cheat because they were so green. They were just starting. So they were supposed to be heels, but they really just beat up everybody that you put in front of them. That makes a baby face. So there has to be some weakness or some dislikable quality or, or the, the heel, a monster heel has to be presented as doing something for all the wrong reasons or motivation or stealing something from somebody. Or they become like the Road Warriors did, baby faces. Our next question, Jim sent in via email the corny drive through at gmail.com from Pete C in Detroit, Michigan. Not sure if you are fans of the WWE Hall of Fame, but what is the deal with the glaring omission of demolition? Do you think that Barry Darso and Bill Eady will ever enter the WWE Hall of Fame? Being that both of these gentlemen were one of the WWE's most successful tag teams ever, what, in your opinion, is the deal with them being kept out? One would think that the admission of one of the most successful tag teams that the WWE ever had would be very good for business amongst nostalgic fans. I got to be honest with you, I didn't know until right now. Well, you know, but I don't memorize who's in the thing. So when somebody says, well, so-and-so isn't in the Hall of Fame, I'm like, well, really, that's, you know, odd. Um, were, did either Bill or Barry ever sue the WWF for anything? Yeah, Bill did. Okay, well, there you go. For the uh, rights to demolition. And I think Randy Colley, oh, sh- who, who just passed away, we should actually probably talk a little bit about him. I believe Randy Colley and Bill both sued for the rights to demolition, which they say they created. Well, there you go. Then that's, there's your answer. Uh, Pete from Detroit or wherever. Is that, um, is that a line for Vince? If you like, you know, cause he's taken so many guys back that he had problems with. If you sue, is that a tough thing for him to get past? Well, it would be for me. I would think it would, you know, I, I don't remember him talking about people that had sued him very fondly, uh, when I was around him and, and the situation came up, but at the same time, if if you've if there's been an issue over who owns the gimmick or whatever, why would he want to glorify the gimmick? He probably also you know see it's not like that's DX. It's not like that Shawn Michaels and Triple H that you know revolutionized a major era in his business. It's demolition. He probably can get away with saying is I think somebody said JYD was, was is he not in the Hall of Fame or he's not in the Observer Hall of Fame but he is in the WWE Hall of Fame. That's um, yeah. Uh, but I mean, once you get past this is the main event guys that we're putting into the Hall of Fame ceremony that's going to draw the sell the tickets and do the business, then everybody else is just you know people that he remembers fondly, or fit a a minority of some description that they've set a criteria for. They got to have one woman, at least they got to have one African-American, at least they got to have apparently one deceased person, but no more than that, because then it gets maudlin. Uh, and you know, if you do shit that Vince doesn't like, it's probably going to work against you down the road. If, if you want to be in, uh, involved in the thing. It is a big omission, though. Three-time tag team champions had a multi-year run, but I could say as a kid, from WrestleMania five to WrestleMania six, I thought Demolition and The Ultimate Warrior were hotter in that company than Hulk Hogan. And I think that's one of the things that started making fans like guys more than Hogan. I mean, obviously, The Warrior got over big time and sold a ton of merch, but people forget about Demolition, just how big and how popular they were with WWF fans in 89. Yeah, well, and see, that's... <sighs> The same thing we just talked about, what turned the Road Warriors babyface. And when you've got a big, strong team that looks like they're out of a science fiction movie and fucking bulldozes everybody and doesn't, you know, and doesn't lose often, they get over. Imagine that. And who could have possibly thought this? Jim, let me ask you about a couple guys that recently passed away. One, Randy Colley, Moondog Rex, obviously many different names. He was one of the assassins at one point. Were you around him much outside of Memphis ever? Um, well, not not really outside of Memphis, but I was around him on several runs in Memphis. Uh, I was a photographer when he and 
uh, Roger Smith were the assassins in what was 78, 79 here. Um, uh, I was here as the for the Moon Dogs. I, as a matter of fact, I was supposed to manage the Moon Dogs until Lawler had a change of heart and gave them to Jimmy Hart too. Wait, uh, so he hold told, on. You were supposed to manage the Fabulous Ones and the Moon Dogs? He had told me, uh, like a week or two before the Moon Dogs got there, that's he had the Moon Dogs coming in because he had all the talent coming in that he had promised spots to when he and Lance were going to open up their own promotion. And instead, when Jarrett agreed to make him partner and they settled everything back down, that's why all the guys that Dundee brought in got their notice. Adrian Street, Miss Linda, the Sheep Herders, um, all the Jesse Barr, all those guys got shipped out because Lawler had guys standing by waiting to come into his new territory. And so in one night, my entire stable uh got uh, lost the loser loser leave town match and had to leave <clears throat> so I, w- I went to him i was like uh jerry uh if <laughs> i got any oh the moon dogs are coming in you're gonna get the moon dogs and that's the last thing that i heard for a week or two and then i think at the same time as the moon dogs debuted on television and it ended up they were managed by jimmy and that was the right thing i wasn't ready for the moon dogs then and they were in a top they they were top heels for that time that run in memphis they drew a lot of money and especially the thing with the fabs i wasn't ready for that it was better that jimmy had it but i think it was the same weekend i was in like tupelo on friday night i, I think that was when uh like my last guy was finishing up and Eddie Marlin always had the TV list tell who was supposed to be on TV the next morning. And he didn't have my name down. I said, you're sure I'm not supposed to be there, Eddie? Cause I've been there a lot. I'm thinking this is bad, right? I'm not on TV. Nope. Your name's not on the list. I said, I'll come. No name's not on the list. If it was on the, if you were there, it'd be on the list. Right. So <laughs> the first time I stay home and don't go to TV, I'm watching it at my cousin's house where I was staying and that's when the Galaxians, Danny Davis and Ken Wayne debuted their first match. And I heard fucking Lancer Dave, one of the others say the Galaxians here today without their manager, Jim Cornette. I'm like, Newman, what the <laughs> fuck? What the fuck? I'm like, it gave me hope that, you know, I'm, I'm not fucking done. And at the same time, I'm like, now they're going to be mad at me. Cause I wasn't there. I wasn't there. It was Owen. So I fucking, then of course that night and, Nashville, right? I go, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, well, you, they just left you off the list. No heat. Because it was a last minute decision. Lawler said, well, what the fuck? I can't give Cornette the fucking moon dogs. They got to give them to Jimmy. But now what's he going to do? So he stuck me in the last minute with Danny and Ken. And it was that was good for me because they were an underneath team. But they actually, to be quite honest, as far as performing professional wrestling, as far as workers, they were much better then Larry Latham and Randy Colley. And so they taught me more about how to manage tag teams and how sp- high spots worked and how to, to get heat on the baby face and, and pace a match and stuff. It got me ready to manage tag teams. Whereas, and we didn't draw a goddamn dime, but they were better workers. The moon dogs were a gimmick on top in the main events and wasn't a place for on the job training with a fucking rookie manager. Because I wouldn't have learned anything except how to duck and stay out of the fucking way. Any stories about Randy Colley? Any funny instances? What kind of guy was um, he? Anything you could tell us? Well, no, and I just saw Randy. Well, that's right. We got off of Randy. I saw uh, Randy. Gosh, where was it? It was at one of the fan fests in the last year or so. And, and uh, no, he was a good guy. He was a, he was a, he was a country guy, country boy. Um, And, you know, he was just, he was one of those guys that got in the business he was big and strong and he had a good look in various gimmicks and he he knew the business and he understood what you know what got over and was able to work you know like i said in a variety of different gimmicks and as different people but he never really became a star as himself because he was always getting put in either a mass team or a gimmick team or even you know, when he tried to work the uh, demolition gimmick himself, I think, in Continental. Um, Detroit demolition. Detroit demolition after the when the whole thing was up in the air there. he it, But he was a great worker and a great talent and a nice guy. And, you know, funny to be around. I don't really have any 
incredible stories never traveled with him but he he was a good guy and he was one of those guys that in the old days could always be a star in wrestling because you could just change yourself into somebody else as a single with no mask and no gimmick randy collie never really became a star but in his various personas he was he worked in a lot of top territories and was a big fucking deal another name who it's not that he recently passed away. It's that we recently found out. Apparently, it happened last spring. Rene Goulet. Any stories about Rene Goulet, Sergeant Jacques Goulet? Yeah, we, we and we had talked about him not long ago, saying, gosh, you know, he doesn't come back around and do any of the reunions. We haven't seen him in a while. And, and then to find this out, um, the first time I saw him, the Legionnaires came into Indianapolis. And they were following some great heel teams like the Black Jacks and the Valiant Brothers. But it instantly perked me up because Don Fargo was the original partner. It was Sergeant Jacques Goulet of the French Foreign Legion and Private Don Fargo, right? And Fargo had been in Indianapolis, you know, on and off for 10 years as <clears throat> part of the Hells Angels and the Chain Gang and all that shit. And he'd worked on top and everything, so everybody knew who he was. But they were a good-looking, rough team. They did the good promos. Sarge had the fucking, you know, gravelly voice and everything, and he legitimately did have a French accent. So that that worked out. And then, of course, Fargo did what Fargo does and left the territory, and they brought in so Soldier LeBuff, but he was, uh, oh, goddamn, what was his name that uh, more people would know him as? I can't remember. He really worked in Tennessee for a while as the Russian stomper. He was Maxine Zarinov LeBuff in the Maritimes. Anyway, he was a big fucker, so they were a good-looking team, so I'd gotten to see... Uh, Goulet, instead of Rene Goulet, who I'd heard as this baby face, I'd seen pictures in the magazines. He and Carl Gotch, of all people, were the WWF tag team champions. Sergeant Jacques Goulet is the fucking rough French Foreign Legion fuck, right? And and I just loved the Legionnaires. So fucking 10 years later, when I go to the WWF and he's an agent, I'd actually, it always tickled me. After that, that there is fucking Rene Goulet. He's got the tie on and the shirt and all the things that Vince made the agents wear. And he's just the nicest, friendliest guy. And I kept thinking of him taking the riding crop to Private Fargo and making him do push-ups. Uh, but Rene Goulet is the one who had the famous line about Doink the Clown. They used to put Rene on the headset sometimes in those early TV tapings, like in early 90s. And the headset communicates with the truck from the gorilla position with what's going on. Well, one time they've got a, a, a production dead time where they're changing tape or they've got some issue that, and, and the crowd's getting restless. So they send, this was when Doink the Clown was just starting and the people didn't know that he was a heel, right? He was just the clown that was going out and entertaining people in the audience. He was going to do something dastardly later. But they're in Philadelphia and they send Doink out. You've heard of this, right? They send fucking Doink out to entertain the people while they they're down for production, and goddamn, he goes up in the bleachers, and the people are hot, and they're tired of waiting, and it's a long TV taping, and they fucking start fucking with Doink, and they're grabbing his fucking clown hair, and they're fucking playing grab ass with him, and then somebody actually grabs him as he's going up the general admission seats, right, the fucking bleachers. Somebody grabs his foot, and he goes down. And Rene Goulet is on headset, and he's telling the, the TV truck, right? He's like, the clown is down. The clown is down. <laughs> hey, fucking, uh, they had to go rescue goddamn Doink from the people, the sports fans of Philadelphia. Uh, but he, 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 Rene, he was one of the, the, the junior agents in that he, you know, would do uh, some of the matches maybe on TV work with some of the job guys. He would also, I think, switch up and be one of the guys that might check up at the box office along with like the the other town. If they had two towns and Dave Hebner was in one, Renee might be doing the box office checkup. Um, so he wasn't like, you know, Pat Patterson, the, the senior official, but he had been there for years and done a good job. And, and Vince rewarded guys like that, like Steele and Lanza and all those guys with, you know, positions after they got out of the ring. Do you think a lot of people don't realize just how big a star he was in various places? The AWA, Indianapolis. Obviously, he had that run as the tag team champion with Carl Gotch and the WWF. He was in a lot of different places, but a yeah. lot of people just think of him as the agent with the hair. Well, that's because, once again, pre-video. 
he's his whole in ring career mostly came pre videotape and he was a good looking guy with a you know a nice body and the baby face you know look in the 60s or, or whatever and and you know he did work uh, almost everywhere but nobody sees that anymore that's why Wild Bull, Bull Curry isn't in the Hall of Fame for heaven's sake well as we close out 2019 we want to remind you of course you could listen to the Jim Cornette experience when it debuts each and every Friday and don't forget for the next week and a half three different omnibus specials coming at you Dave Meltzer on the experience Jim Ross on the experience as well as a collection of the live Jim Cornette experiences that were previously done at the Charlotte Legends Fan Fest check those out we will be back with fresh programming the first week of January or at least later in the week the first week of January want to remind you you can follow Jim on Twitter at the Jim Cornette you can follow me on Twitter at great Brian last you can hear me on the 605 super podcast at 605pod.com, available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcast. If you want to hear a little more Jim Cornette content, the most recent episode, our Hall of Fame special, a great discussion with Jim and Scott Teal about this year's class for the Wrestling Observer Newsletter Hall of Fame. Of course, Cornette's Collectibles at jimcornette.com. By the time you hear this, he will be ignoring all the orders that come in for the better part of two weeks. Anything you want to say about Cornet's collectibles here, Jim. I don't know what we should say at this point. <laughs> Once again, Jim. Thank you, everybody, for making this a record year for Cornet's collectibles, too. I'm taking until January 2nd to uh, ring my brain out, but then I'll be back shipping shit as swiftly as shit can be shipped. Jim Cornet's drive through is sponsored by the law office of Stephen P. New, 888 888- 6928084 or visit newlawoffice.com. He is the consigliere of the Cult of Cornet and a great man. He can help you if you need help. But until next year, for Jim Cornet, I'm the great Brian Last. Thank you for a fantastic 2019. Tally ho! Wee-hoo!